Welcome to the Modern Law Library. I'm your host, Lee Rawls, and today I'm speaking with Dave Cullen, author of the book Parkland. Dave, thank you so much for joining us. Hi, thanks for having me, Lee. So this is not the first of your books that I've read. You're also the author of Columbine, which, of course, is about another school shooting. Could you talk a little bit about how you first started in this area and what drove you after this harrowing experience writing Columbine to write this book, Parkland, about the shooting that happened at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School? Sure. Well, yeah, I've been uh, doing this for 20 years, and I sure never expected to. And, you know, I never would have thought uh, 20 years ago this April, um, you know, I I lived in Denver, and um, I just turned on the television for lunch as it was just um, starting. It was just hitting local news, reports of some gunfire, and no reports of anyone even injured. And so I thought, oh, it's probably nothing But um, I drove out there just in case, didn't even know where it was, had never heard of Columbine High, uh, and sort of fumbled my way toward it. Um, Although on the way, I saw a circle of helicopters overhead to the south that looked like vultures circling. And that was my first, that was really the first moment where my stomach sank and I got a sense of what we might be in for and actually like drove toward them. That's how I found it by driving toward um, until I hit a police barricade. So that was kind of the start for me. And that was about noon on April 20th um, when uh, just actually about the time the the killers were dying in the school, though we wouldn't know that for four more hours. Um, And, you know, I had no idea that I had just stumbled into something horrific and that would that would really set in the motion really 20 years of what now is the school shooter era, which has really morphed into this mass, you know, mass shooter era. And, um, I, you know, there were several like, points in that time that I didn't just think I was done with it. I just, you know, said a huge sigh of relief, including the first time a month after Columbine, I had kind of embedded in the evangelical community and, and to do a, a long, month long piece on, on what that was like in Columbine evangelicals. And when I finished that, I said, OK, whew, OK, done with Columbine on to other things, you know, never do that again. And I thought that was true. And there were several more points. But, you know, instead I kept being pulled back and being pulled back and spent 10 years on the book. And um, and then, unfortunately, became kind of the mass murder guy for television. I was sort of like the go-to analyst when these things happened, so they they would have me on. Um, and editors asking me to write about things, so I, I kept doing it. And I, and I developed a cadre of really great experts from the FBI and, and other sort of experts on this who would bring me into their sort of email chains uh, early on behind the scenes discussing what was happening, what they thought about these killers. So... I got to be a part of something of, you know, people much smarter than me who understand this much better and, and included me in these things. So, you know, I've gone, I've, I've written a lot of other things, but this has become a thing that I can't kind of avoid. And I, I kind of feel responsibility. And when Parkland happened, oddly enough, I had been thinking for several years, it was time to really let this go. And just, I can't do this anymore. And I had two bouts of secondary PTSD, two really bad breakdowns, seven years apart, writing Columbine, and kind of decided, and I told Chris Cuomo on New Day the morning after um, after Parkland off the air when we talked about it, that I think this might be the last one. I think I might refuse all interviews after this because I just can't do this anymore. But on the elevator down from that interview, David Hogg was on the same segment as me uh, in, in Parkland, um, and they've got they've got monitors in the elevators at the Time Warner Center um, at, at CNN headquarters. And I saw David's interview on the way down in the elevator, and I was so stunned. I didn't get off when I got to the bottom floor, and there's a lot of elevators there, um, so I just stayed for the next five minutes or eight minutes or whatever, watched the entire thing and walked out of there gaping like, this is different. I, I've, you know, I've spent 20 years with survivors and they, this is not a one day survivor. They don't think this way. They don't behave. They're not ready for this. And then I went home and there were lots of, you know, his whole school's reacting that way. And I'm like, wow, something, something's different here. 
and and maybe I do need to go back this time and break my rule. If my my shriek would have strangled me, so I, I just didn't tell her um, that I was going back because yeah, I wasn't allowed to do that. But I, I didn't go to back back to document a killer or to document grief and pain and the horror. I went back to tell the story of of kids responding and doing something powerful and hopefully finding a way out of this. So hopefully this is kind of full circle where Parkland won't be the last of these, but hopefully it's, it's the route out and it's the beginning of the end is what I think, you know, we'll know in 10 or 20 years looking back, but I think this will be the beginning of the end. This was a very powerful experience for me personally, as a reader, I was 18 when the Columbine shootings happened and, you know, I was I was in Illinois. I was very far from Colorado. But I, at that age, just thought, oh, well, this is so awful. And surely the adults are going to respond. Things are going to change. There are going to be new gun laws. And I am now, you know, some 20 years older. And over those 20 years, I realized, oh, no, some things did change. Some laws were rewritten. And it seemed to make gun laws more lax. Mm -hmm. And I actually remember on the day of the Parkland shooting, just, I believe I saw an interview with a Columbine survivor and I just, my stomach sank and I thought, oh, I as an adult feel like I didn't do enough for these kids. And then you watch how these kids responded. Could you talk a little bit about the differences you saw in this group of students and why you think they had this powerful, different response. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it was night and day. I think maybe the worst day of my life and what caused me to spend all those years on Columbine was the morning after Columbine. Because the day, it, the afternoon it happened, it was pandemonium, with chaos, people running around, hugging each other, sobbing uncontrollably, just, you know, hysterical. It was kind of exactly what you would imagine it would be. Like everyone I've ever talked to, the picture in your head, that's, that's, that's pretty much it. The morning after was completely different and shocked me. Almost no one was crying. And, and virtually the whole student body came to Clement Park, uh, the park surrounding the school. And first there was a huge ceremony, at, at, at a huge church that could hold them at, at 10 a.m. Um, so I witnessed most of the survivors barely a tear. They had, you know, this blank affect. <sighs> I, you know, I struggled. they looked like they had been lobotomized, most of them. Just this, there, there were these walking zombies. And that was like the that was the most unnerving thing of the whole part. In fact, that changed the way I thought about Columbine, because for the first almost twenty four hours, I was focused on the people who had died, and I was just horrified that you know fifteen people had died, there thirteen victims and the killers, um, and that was to me it was about these these horrible murders. In the morning after, and kind of going forward, I thought about it more than 2,000 survivors, because I kind of made the mental break that morning that um, that was horrible that these people had died, but it was too late to save them. There's nothing we could do for them anymore. Um, but these kids, these 2,000 kids, I really wondered, is this going to be like, you know, the worst of the Vietnam War vets? Will they be shell-shocked for life? Are they, will they ever recover from this? And I really didn't know. And and if they did, like, how how would they get through it? And, and who who would lead them out of this? And so that's, you know, I didn't know I was going to write a book that next day, but I knew I would be on the story for a while, and I'd come back because I just had to know what happened to those kids. And the Parkland kids were completely different than that um, because the Columbine kids, it was such a left hook. You know, it's almost as if, like, like you know, Martians had attacked. Right, you know, it's not like, it's not like something horrible happened. It, it's like the, you know, it turns out, oh, the monsters under your bed really do exist. You do have to be afraid of them. It's this whole new fear that, like, what? Like, you know, you know, we were afraid of all these different, you know, possible things. My plane might crash. We might be in a car accident, or you know, all these kind of known things in the world that somebody might storm your high school and, like, you know, shoot you all up and plant bombs and try to blow you up. Like, this might happen when you go to school. I mean, that's why Columbine. I think it still has such resonance because I've talked to so many parents who ever since then 
fear and also feel guilt about sending their kids to school. Like, you know, I, am I sending my kids to their death? So that's what happened. Those kids just never saw it coming. But the Parkland kids, sadly, they did see it coming. So many of them told me that, yeah, we're kind of expecting this. You know, not necessarily at their school, but maybe at their school, but obviously to some schools, you know, either their friends or someone they know in another state or, or other kids, it's going to happen. Now this is a fact of life. So they were horrified, but they weren't, they weren't quite shocked. So they were in a place where they were ready uh, to do something. And not only were they not shocked and expecting it, they were pissed off. Before this ever happened, this entire generation of kids now kind of feel like you and I did. And like David Hogue said that first day of, or the morning after, you know, we're children, you're adults. And David Hogg really called out adult America. I, he didn't put it this way, but I, essentially what he meant is, you have failed us. You are letting your kids die, America. Like, what are you doing? Like, you're sentencing your children to death. And you've had 20 years. You could have done so many things. You had way more time than was necessary. We should have solved this in a year or two, or maybe three would be sort of irresponsible. 20 years, and we've done nothing. And as if you said, like, we've regressed. The, you know, the assault weapons ban expired. All sorts of additional laws. We've made it worse. That's just despicable. And, and, and they know that. And they were, they were pissed off. And they, you know, they called us out. And I think that's why they had such an impact, because every adult in America, including gun owners and lots of NRA members, heard David Hogg. And, you know, the truth hurts. And, and, and knew he was right. And like, my God, we are letting our children die. And I, I, I think that's what changed. We, had, we needed a cold slap in the face by some of these kids to say, you know, say like, what the hell are you people doing? And why are you still letting us die? So one of the other differences between the book Columbine and the book Parkland is, you know, in Columbine, the process of writing it for you was much, much longer. The Parkland shooting, you and I are speaking today, it's February 7th, so it has not quite been a year. And yet so much has happened. So much has happened in these kids' lives. And you document that. How was just the process of writing Parkland different for you? Yeah, it was a completely different process and completely different focus of the books. So in Columbine, I tried to do two stories, one about the killers and what drove them, and then what the survivors did and you know how they, they recovered from this. And so there was sort of like the before and after stories, and I intercut them. Um, so that was Columbine. And, and, and what I wanted to do, the reason I kind of took 10 years is – to do it from a distance and to understand and, and for what they, to see the survivors through that whole 10 years and, you know, it changed and you know, to see the recovery, um, sort of like the arc that that took, um, but also to really spend years researching the killers. It took me years to get to the FBI and to get the permission for those people to talk to me and to really understand what had happened here. So it was a much more sort of like more distant reflective look. And with Parkland, this is a book almost exclusively about the March for Our Lives kids and the responders and, and some of the other people involved, like, you know, Tio Manny, one of the, uh, the fathers of uh, Joaquin Oliver. But it's, a, it's about the people responding. And, just you know, I just barely touch on the killer, refuse to name him. Um, just, you know, a couple pages of background. Literally, I think there's two pages on him and the event itself. But it's, a, it's about the response. And in terms of the process, I decided early on that, like, this isn't going to be a reflective look, you know, many years down the road. This is a this is a book in the moment while it's happening. And I wanted, wanted to do not just the movement itself, but really the birth of the movement. And, and partway through, I, I talked to my, my editor, we have sort of a disposable or kind of invisible subtitle, is birth of a movement is only inside the book. It's, you know, it's not on the cover or on the spine of it. It's, the main title is Parkland, and then there's sort of this subtitle and that helped me sort of focus that's what it's about it's about the birth and i wanted it while it was still happening because we're still i think we're still in the early days of this of this march for our lives movement this is you know anti-gun crusade and, and and you know as i thought about it as i was writing it there's so many parallels to the civil rights movement that kind of shocked me and you know everything for the kids you know wearing dog tags with martin luther king's principles around their necks but it occurred to me, if I were doing a book on the civil rights movement, 
I'd always thought, you know, I would do Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, unfortunately, his assassination, but, you know, it, probably the passage of the Civil Rights Law in 1964, you know, sort of like the landmark event. Now, with this experience, I would do it differently. I think the book I would want to write about the Civil Rights Movement it would be set in the, in the 1950s, and perhaps even before that, in the 40s. How did this begin? Now, you know, we always see you know, the climaxes of these things, and how does it come to fruition, which is great. But um, I'm, I'm more interested in, like, I, I would want to, you know, research Martin Luther King's trip to India, where he met with Mahatma Gandhi and really helped, you know, formulate his ideas or crystallize his ideas on how we would do this, on, you know, the Freedom Riders and the early things and, you know, the, the early failures of the things they tried to do, like what really were the seeds that, that got this going? And, um, you know, that's what I tried to do here in this book. Now, because it came in such a rush, you know, the first year is much more than just sort of the kernels of it. But, but I want to know what was, what was the lift up? How did this, you know, happen? And, and what happened behind the scenes? Because, you know, I mean, it was such an odyssey of the first 10 months that they spent. And I want to sort of like take you behind the scenes and, and know what is it like to, you know, an uprising or a kind of cultural revolution? Um, how does that begin and how does it take off and, and you know, what's happening there? So, um, and, and I wanted to be published while that's still happening and to kind of be part of that conversation, you know, not do retrospectively, not a history book. And, you know, you talk about wanting to be part of the conversation. And one thing I found so striking is as you are talking to these kids, these kids are hyper aware of the media environment and of the necessity that if they want to remain part of the national conversation, if they want to remain in the news, in people's minds, keep people's attention, they need to be fast. They need to be so fast. And you know, one thing I also found remarkable was, you know, I hadn't followed this so closely that I understood that, yes, this was a group of kids, but even from day one, day two, there were kids doing things independently of each other who then later merged. It wasn't mm -hmm. just one group. It was, you know, there are multiple kids who immediately are striking out and, and trying to do things, and then they kind of come together. When you're talking in the first you know, few weeks to the kids as they're putting together the ride to Tallahassee to talk to their state legislatures, as they're putting together the Washington, D.C. event. This sense of urgency that was so striking in the book, what was it like to be around these kids who'd just been through this tremendous trauma and be around that energy? And why do you think they were able to turn around so quickly that it didn't take months that they didn't fall off the national radar. You're right. They, they realized day one they needed to be fast, but they also needed to be like clever and funny, um, entertaining and sort of empathetic. They were, they were so media savvy. But they get the, you know, probably they'd watched these other things and they'd watched the Great Hope after Newtown um, and that fall apart. And the fact that, you know, Obama waited, I think it was five weeks or something, for a State of the Union address, and, and, you know, the administration really tried to get their ducks in a row to figure out, you know, legislatively how to do this, and that was way too long. And the sense of outrage in the country and the will to do something had already faded. And they learned from that, and they knew, we're doing this day one. And while the country is in a sense of outrage, and determine we have to do something this time. We're going to jump on that, and we're going to start making that happen. And, you know, Jackie Corrin, who's kind of, you know, probably the biggest hero of my book, um, is kind of the implementer of the group, who you may never have heard of, but she plays an amazing role. Because it's all these creative kids, and then she was the junior class president, you know, the doer, who, like, gets things done. Like, okay, great ideas. You now, like, we're going to do this, and we're going to do that. And, like, she makes it happen. So she's kind of just kind of amazing. But she realizes that first night, like, we need to do something. We don't need to just be on TV talking about this. You know, we need to act and show that we're not just kids who are, like, whining or complaining. You know, we need to get butts together and do something. And she organized, you know, within, I think, six days after it happened, she organized three big bus loads of kids, of 100 kids from the school, to drive up to Tallahassee, which, you know, because of, you know, Florida, the shape of it, it, it took nine hours to get there up the turnpike. 
and um, you know, they when they got back, you know, they spent a little over 24 hours there and, you know, got back at like three in the morning um, to make this happen. Um, but they were just going for it. And, and, and they understood all these things and the sense of momentum. And then each thing they did built on another. You know, I think because almost all the kids in the group were either drama kids or uh, a lot of them were, were, you know, news kids. David Hogg was news director at, you know, the school, you know, they were, they were on their own TV station, WOSD. They got how the media works. And, you know, also this whole generation, you know, they make content providers like every day on their Instagram stories and Snapchat and a little bit Facebook, all these different platforms. And some of them have YouTube things that, like they've been creating content and like bouncing it around with their friends since they were little kids. And the entire generation sort of has media savvy, most of us, you know, adults don't. But these kids also happen to be particularly good at it. Like these were like the creative kids who were performers and creating a satire paper at their school and and, and creating an improv group of their own. And um, so they're, you know, they're sort of like standout brilliant people at this. So they, they knew how to make it work and to get their generation and the adult generation involved. And then very quickly, they figured out, like you said, to to bring in other groups, they realize they're, they're mainly a bunch of white kids and they're affluent white kids. And that after all these school shootings, there's this horror that, oh, you know, these sort of attractive, affluent suburban white kids are in danger. And, oh, oh, that's horrible. Meanwhile, a much larger number of people of color in cities in Chicago and Baltimore and D.C. and Compton and all over the country are getting killed in much larger numbers. And we're kind of shrugging our shoulders and not really doing anything about that. And they realize their white privilege. And we're also already pissed about that before this happened to them and decided right away, okay, this is not going to be an uprising against school shootings. This is going to be an uprising about gun violence to kids or to young people. And within about a week and a half, they met with a group of um, African-American kids from Chicago that an organization you know, flew down there to meet at Emma Gonzalez's house, and they had a meeting. In fact, when, when, when the Parker kids found out about it, this it was proposed on a Friday, would you want to meet with some of these kids? They said, yes, can we do it tomorrow? Because it's a weekend, you know, kids will be back in school. They didn't want to wait another week. Can, you know, if you guys can get them down and, you know, Emma, within like a few hours, like I talked to our parents, and like, we can do it at my house. And they were down there, and they were meeting, and that, that really changed everything. And, and then they continued with that group of Chicago kids and lots of other uh, urban groups. And, and that's the way, you know, was the bridge to like, okay, there's already this movement in the African-American community and, and other communities, urban communities, about dealing with gun violence. We're going to fuse those two movements, and we're going to build this movement of ours and fuse it with yours and work together. And those kids have been a huge part of it ever since. That's one of the things I loved about the, you know, the Parkland kids. They weren't just trying to save themselves. They were trying to save all the kids in America of every color, uh, ethnicity, what have you, from getting killed by guns. How did you approach them and how did you enter their spaces and what were you doing to observe this? How did you interact with them? Were you in the corner of a room? I just am curious about your process for understanding what they were doing. Sure. You know what? They were overwhelmed by media requests. And I mean, I mean, literally like hundreds of day. Um, you know, I got to do you know, Pippi, who was um, their scheduler. And she said, you know, I get up and I'll be like 100 different emails of media requests. And this is like, this was in May. So months later. Um, still, there'll be like 100 requests. I can maybe seriously deal with about 20 of those in, the, in a day. I have to figure out which 80 to ignore and which 20 to focus on. You know, and that's my day. And the next morning, I started over. You know, so that's, that's like three months out. Um, in the first month or two, it was just so much more than that. So, so um, they were overwhelmed. And, and I kind of figured out very quickly, and I've been sort of through this before, is like, Showing up is, you know, I think Woody Allen said, you know, 99% of life is showing up. And uh, that was definitely the case here. It's um, once I got to know them, I would always, before I took trips down there, try to arrange as many interviews in advance as I could. And that usually didn't work very well. I just had to like fly down there and then I would start texting him. Hey, 
I'm in town at the Marriott. You know, do you have time to meet in the next, you know, four days I'm here? And they'd be like, okay, sure. How about tomorrow? So showing up was really half the battle with these kids or 90% of the battle. And I, I showed up the, that first uh, weekend. Um, I arrived on Sunday or Monday afterwards for the Tallahassee trip and rented the car to caravan up there with them behind the bus. But I think the first decision I made was to go to the, the pre-meeting the night before, the organizational meeting. And before that, before I left New York City to go down there, I, I talked to the kids on the phone. I talked to David Hogg, and he put me on the speakerphone with all the kids, including Jackie, who's organizing it. And I said, you know, I, I really want to get the sense of what it's like behind the scenes and, and how you're doing this. That's, you know, an imperative I had from the beginning is like wanting to understand, like, how does this happen? And they'd already announced the March on Washington, this massive thing. And I thought, like, how are these kids going to pull it off? And really, truthfully, I was thinking, will these kids pull that off? You know, five weeks seemed crazy. And will it be kind of half-assed or will it be this kind of great thing? You know, and, and I wanted to see how how that would take place and how they did it. So, you know, I asked if, you know, do you have some, you know, I'd love to sit on your meetings before. And they said, well, we're going to have this organizational meeting, but you don't want to come to that. It's going to be just really boring. And I'm like, oh, no, that's what I want to do. And they're like, no, seriously, it's going to be like permission slips and telling kids like what to wear and what to pack and, you know, those kind of mundane logistical things and where to meet. And I was like, no, that is exactly what I want to say. Like, uh, you know, I don't want to just do the, you know, the story of like, oh, here are the kids in the Capitol. Like, as if they're magically here and they're meeting with legislators. I want to give you the backstory of like, how did this come about? Like, what's it like to be one of those kids? And like the day before, are you, a, are you nervous about it? Are you wondering what to wear? You know, all those kinds of things. So I think just showing up for that, and, and I didn't do it because there would be fewer media there, but that was a side benefit. There was hardly any media. Like most media did think like, oh, that's boring. We don't care. Or didn't, didn't ask and didn't know it existed. But I was like one of the few reporters there. So I was already meeting the 100 kids and some of their parents uh, that day. And then, you know, the bus trip up there, there were, there were three rest stops along the way. Cause you know, the kids they had to stop and go to the bathroom and stuff and get something to eat, you know, over nine hours. And part of what I've learned to do is, is not be in your face. And I mean, I think the biggest thing to being a good reporter with like, and, and working your way into a group is not being a, I don't know what I'm allowed to say, it, not being a, a, a dick or <laughs> an a-hole. Um, yeah, it just, yeah, just being a being a nice guy, being like a human being. So uh, on the first rest stop, try to talk to them. I gave them their space, but you know, toward the end, if you came over and you know asked me like, "Oh, so you're following us up here," or like you know, chatted me a little bit. By the second rest stop, a lot of them were sort of like you know, they got a little bored and like wondering about these reporters, and so they were coming to me. And uh, and by, <laughs> by the third rest stop, like. You know, we were racing, you know, off the bus to the urinal and like just chatting with the guys, like literally, you know, standing beside, you know, to the bathroom in the line and at the urinal. And, you know, by then, like, you know, they met me the night before and like, you know, then we were at the high school. So just hanging around with them. But I think the biggest thing is like <sighs> training high school kids like they're adults, like not because they kind of are. And like not talking down to them, not dumbing it down, not condescending, not preaching to them listening mainly and also being empathetic and getting what they've gone through. I mean, just all the basic things of just sort of being a decent human being, which a lot of reporters are, but sadly some aren't. I mean, you know, some reporters are so it has to be after the story and they just, you know, batter through and like, okay, well you might get the first story, but, uh, but you know what? I also realized by the way, that trip to Tallahassee, it was frustrating because you know, it's being part of the pack in pack journalism. And I just, I kept thinking, God, I hate pack journalism. Like literally there were hundreds of reporters and trying to get near the kids or getting a chance to talk to them is hard. But I also, you know, keep thinking like, why do I even need to be here? We're all going to write the same story. We're going to talk to the same people. Like, why is it necessary? What am I doing here? You know, am I really helping the world in any way? But I kept, you know, this conversation in my head, I kept answering like, yeah, I know what you're, what's happening, what's going to happen here. And the way out of this is um, you're going to stay. Like most of these parachute journalists are going to, you know, parachute. They're going to be here today and maybe tomorrow, and then they're going to go home. And you're going to stay. And that's what I learned at Columbine. You just stay. 
and they really respect that and will open up. And I'm not, I don't mean to be knocking journalists because um, everybody's got a different job. And the daily journalists, well, they, they can't afford to just stay. And even, uh, you know, a lot of, they go on to other assignments. And, and luckily, I, I went down there first. I wasn't trying to write a book, but coming up for Vanity Fair, and I signed a contract to do five weeks and to do a series of stories for the website and then possibly for the print magazine later and work on a video documentary. And I had five weeks with them. That's all I was going to do. So I knew right away, like, I don't have any other job. I don't have any other stories to file. All I have to do is, like, follow these kids. Work. And it's not just about today's story. It's about developing a relationship. And, um, you know, they're great kids. I just, you know, started bonding with them right away. But over time, I try to interact with them as, in as many different ways as possible. And, you know, I'll... Some with, you know, formal interviews, um, but mostly, you know, sort of hanging out and, and chatting and, and getting in any situation they could. So when a, several of them were involved in the, putting on this production of Spring Awakening, which it has all these parallels. It was written because of Columbine. And it has all these parallels in Cameron Caskey, who sort of created March for Our Lives, was, had to, has a lead role and this really sort of like powerful parallels. It's things he has to do on the stage that are just extraordinary. And several other kids were involved in it. So, you know, I, I went to some of the her- rehearsals of that. I went down for opening night, the first couple of performances. I ha- hung out with Cameron. Like, I went three hours before the matinee performance and just hang out with the actors while they were just sort of, like, getting ready when their guard was down. You know, I went to the... Um, you know, I, I went to several different like social kind of things with them like that. Once I got to know them, they actually invited me into the headquarters, which... Well, I, I don't want to be my, like I was the only reporter who was who they invited in. There, uh, one of the adults who helped do media for them granted exclusive print access to Time Magazine and exclusive video to 60 Minutes. So those two groups were in there, and I kind of didn't realize this, but uh, I, the kids by this point liked me, and so I'm the only person they invited in. Then it was found out, and so they had to close it down. So it didn't last that long, but. Um, just sort of hanging out and seeing what they do. And, you know, one of the things when, you know, Jackie gave me a quick tour of it, and she's like, oh, you know, there's this room, and here's the writer's room. And I'm thinking, the writer's room? And then I, I, I talked to Matt Deitch, who played a really pivotal role, because I met him there. I'm thinking, who is this guy? And so I'm like, can I talk to you? Um, and he's like, oh, yeah. And then, you know, he's like, okay, we'll go back into the writer's room. And that's when I'm like, the writer's room? <laughs> you have a writer's room? And he looks at me. and They were so professional. Like, I, I know. but I, And he was like, you think this stuff is writing itself. And that was such an eye-opening moment to me of like, and, and then, you know, they showed me about like, and they're talking about, oh, so when I did my script, I'm like, scripts? And they were like, of course, like, do you think all these clever tweets and like these, you know, sort of video responses and, you know, the stuff that we're doing online, like, yes, yeah, some of it, you know, is spontaneous. So we see a tweet and respond, but much more of it is like, you know, it's like the SNL staff. It's like, you know, you, you watch Saturday Night Live. The show doesn't just write itself. You know, it's not a bunch of people just show up and like, oh, it's really funny for an hour and a half. Like, you know, they work at it for a week. And these kids are collaborating on this stuff and bouncing around ideas. And like, how should we respond to this NRA thing? Or some politician says some horrible jerky thing or Laura Ingram. And like, they talk it out. And like, it's not just one person off the cuff. It's these people like writing scripts and filming things and brainstorming. So it's this creative group. I'm like, oh, that's what's going on here. That's why you guys are so effective and have these massive followings. Like, you know. um, And I actually, sorry to break in, but when I was reading the book, this, this made a lot of sense to me. Obviously, the, the Parkland kids faced backlash. I think we all remember this and, and accusations of, oh, this is staged, false flag, et cetera. But also they must be being directed by, mm-hmm. uh, you know, a group of adults. There, there are so many hands. They're just the puppets. And Harder I think adult. that what people were, were reacting. Yeah. And I think that people were reacting to these kids seem so polished and Mm -hmm. reading the book, I'm like, this is why they seem polished because maybe if you are 17 and a microphone is shoved in your face, you might stumble. But if there's a group of six or seven of you and you can talk beforehand, okay, how do I say something effective? Yeah, right. Exactly. There's 25 of you. And 
you're really good at this. Like, you know, Ryan Deitch, when he was like a sophomore, you know, said like, oh, I really wish there was some improv. And his teacher said, well, why don't you start an improv group? And, you know, and his brother, Matt, was part of it, too. And Cameron Kasky showed up. It was when he was a freshman. And they're used to doing creative stuff. They're like, you know, this is a school of like 3,300 kids. And these are the most creative kids of that group and have had, you know, and also because they're affluent, have, have the money to do kind of thing, these kinds of things and have their own real TV production thing. So they, they've been putting on these shows and doing these things at a pretty high level, you know, for, you know, even the, the, the 17 year olds and 18 year olds for, you know, for four years. And so like they happen to be really good at this. And then, like I said, and then, they're not just individually good at it. They collaborate, and they've got a whole team. So, yeah, we'd like, oh, well, you know, it can't be just a bunch of, you know, dumb kids. Like, the dumb is sort of implied, like, oh, it can't be just a bunch of kids. It must be, like, much smarter adults pulling the strings and doing this. Like, no, it's a really a group of really smart kids. Like, they're smart, too, and they're probably more creative, you know, than you are. And, like, you know, it's kind of almost common. I'm kind of laughing now because, like, oh, they must have had people like the Obama team or some Democrats, like, Really, like these kids could probably be teaching some of the people on those political campaigns. You know, the political operatives who like create these kind of like cringe inducing commercials sometimes. And you're like, really? You thought that's what people would react to? And that are so, you know, poll tested and these smarmy things. Like, you know, these kids are authentic. They're doing something like, you know, stuff that like the smarter adults that we were assuming, you know, should maybe be like taking a lesson from them. It's like, just because like you're a political operative, you're doing this for years, like doesn't mean you're really that great at it. Like, you know, I think most of us are kind of disgusted with like politics and politicians and the political ads we see. Like, who, like, do you, do you like most of the political commercials you see on TV? Like, I want to throw up at a lot of them. So like, why do we think, oh, it must be somebody extraordinary, like those people who are doing that crappy stuff. No, it's a bunch of kids who were like, who are authentic, who aren't trying to be, you know, who aren't trying to second guess and do this smarmy stuff. They're being themselves. I'm like, that's much better. But as they're doing this, you know, they are savvy. They are so talented. They're also very traumatized and they're responding so well, but it is still such a situation to be thrust into. There's actually a passage in your book I was hoping you could read for our listeners about the first day that they actually had to go back to Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School and what that was like for one of the kids. Would you mind reading that passage? Sure, yeah. That's, I'm glad you brought that up because I would forget that sometimes. That would seem so, they would seem like they were so well adjusted about this and then they would tell me things that'll be, oh yeah, you're, you're still recovering. Okay, so um, this is the chapter back to normal with normal in quotes. Wednesday, February 28th, school resumed. Reporters were everywhere. Daniel was annoyed. He was happy to talk to them, but not to be inundated with them. The drop-off line was monstrous that morning. Obviously, parents didn't want to leave their kids alone, Daniel said. His mom wasn't afraid of a repeat shooter, so she drove around toward the back gate, which was further away, but still so many reporters. Daniel was navigating the press gauntlet when a reporter asked if he had a minute to talk. No time, he said. He was trying to make an appointment with, with another one. They both erupted in laughter. Class schedule began that day, but not really class. So much Play-Doh and so many comfort dogs, Daniel said. I don't know what kind of meeting they had before, but every classroom had Play-Doh, he said. Sorry to laugh. <laughs> like He was laughing when he said it. I was laughing when he told me. Daniel was getting restless. I did use the Play-Doh one time. I was really bored, he said. I didn't really make anything. I just kind of squished it around in my hand. The comfort dogs, though, those were great. He was eager to get back to work. Not full speed, but something. But, but some of the kids were still in shock, not ready for any stress, so they had to take it slow. And sometimes he needed it slow, especially in the classes he had with Jamie and Gina. I was really good friends with Gina, so sometimes I'll look over and see the empty chair. And I know I talk about that a lot, and I know a lot of people talk about that a lot, but that's one of the things that really hits me the worst. Daniel was so excited to have a diversion, both from his grief and his activism. Something to be a part of that isn't political, he said. To be a kid again. I'm wearing a March for Our Lives t-shirt right now. And he was still looking to do something creative with his life. 
He reflected on his artistic ambitions, seriously considering photography. But just mentioning it dredged up a painful memory. I was so mad at all the photographers of the vigil the day after the shooting, he said. The moment of silence, I just heard camera shutters clicking the whole time. My friend Emma was like bursting crying and she was hugging me for support and there was a camera in my face taking pictures of me. Four weeks later, it still burned. Well, thank you for reading that passage. So, Dave, was there anything you found particularly surprising in the course of your reporting? Yeah, I mean, there were two huge surprises. One was what an odyssey this was. Um, and number two is that they m- merged their movement with this, you know, wider movement of urban violence. But the first one really is really what this book is about, because I think most people out there, including a lot of reporters that I know who covered the story early on, kind of felt like these kids did this amazing thing last spring, in, you know, after, after the tragedy. And they, they organized this the March on Washington that's sort of in a virtual tie is the third or fourth largest single-day protest in American history, which is unbelievable, which high school kids did. So everyone was just blown away by everything these kids did. And then they apparently went back to school. And occasionally you'd see them pop up on The Daily Show or Jimmy Kimmel or something. And I think most of America thinks that's what was happening. And it is so different. After spending 10 months with them on this marathon sprint, where they were just like sprinting at full blast for 10 months, doing so many things. Like Jackie Corrin had like 10,000 frequent flyer miles like in the first couple of months. And that's before like they even started the two-month bus tour across America. So it was just relentless. The kids basically, for the most part, took a year off of high school and college, where they, some of them did continue that sort of a part-time job, where they were full-time activists just going crazy doing all these doing all these events. And like that's what's really what happened here. That's why they had such a huge impact on the midterms and really set this whole thing in the motion because it was so much more than the march or what I think most people think actually happened here. Well, Dave, thank you so much for joining us for this episode of the Modern Law Library. If our listeners want to contact you or pick up the book, how should they do that? Uh, just go to my website, davecullen.com, and all the information about Parkland and, and Columbine and the book tour and everything are there. And, um, and my email is there so they can contact me. Uh, I love hearing from readers. And thank you to our readers and our listeners for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode of the Modern Law Library, please subscribe, rate, and review on your favorite podcast listening service. That's a big help to us.